Linux computer. Okay. Uh, there's a name I don't recognize. Cass, uh, you have yourself muted. Do you just want to say hi and uh, let us know who you are? Hi, um, I'm in the UK, as you can probably tell from my accent. Um, my first ever attended World's Fair was Hanover, Exports 5000, which was fantastic. I came back, sat on the, in the middle of my living room floor, said I want to go back, and it was one week before it closed. And we, both, we took another week off work and went. And we've oh, been well, to each one since. Great, lovely. Well, welcome and uh, thanks for joining us. Thank Anybody you. here go to uh, Expo 85? Oh, okay. Stephen was there. Great. Well, well, we'll see if we see in any of the pictures. Actually, that's one of the things I know we won't because as I was going through the pictures last night, it reminded me of uh, how few Western faces I saw out there, um, you know, other than people at the American Pavilion or the UK Pavilion, some of the, the workers. But um, it, was, it was interesting. Now, what I'm going to do is uh, throw everybody on mute again in case somebody does pop in or anything. Um, if you do have a question, uh, you can use the raise hand feature. I'll try to see it. You can uh, wave frantically in the screen. I'll try to see it and unmute you. Uh, uh, or you can put it in chat. Now, if it's in chat, again, I won't see it until the end. But if it's something real urgent, Carol can come down the hall and tell me. So uh, just a little bit about background about X-85. I had uh, started working. For, I left Disney in 82, went to Warner Brothers in 84. And then, uh, just like at Disney, I was setting up all their computer security. And about 19, uh, it was 80, 82 I went to Warner's. And in 84, they asked me to take over all the worldwide computer systems. So I ended up with a staff of people in London, uh, people in Tokyo, and uh, I started seeing the world. So I had gotten uh, a kind of unexpected trip. I had to go to Japan, and I was there for a week or so. And then I had to go from there down to Australia New Zealand. And uh, I had not planned the trip about going over there around the World's Fair schedule. I, I once was in, uh, I think it was Oslo, middle winter, middle, it was nasty freezing and everything. And the manager in Oslo asked if I was in some, some sort of trouble in the uh, home office. And I said, no, not that I know of. Why? And he goes, well, nobody comes to Oslo in the middle of winter. And I said, yeah, well, I just spent, you know, a good portion of a summer in Tokyo, which was, uh, was, was fun. Uh, you know, we, we didn't go anywhere based on the other schedules. Uh, we, we did it purely based on the computer schedule. But I was walking across an intersection at lunch one day with uh, the people from the office and the folks that haven't been there, a lot of the intersections in Tokyo are kind of interesting because they stop all the traffic in every direction and you can walk left, right, or whatever, or you can walk diagonally across the uh, uh, intersections as well. So everybody can move very quickly and it, it kept people from getting run over. And as I was walking through the intersection, I had all these giant electronic billboards, which just like the things you see in Blade Runner and everything. And I saw something up there. I, I, I can, all the Japanese I know in the Japanese language is for exit or elevator. That's about it. Uh, but I saw a word I recognized, expo. So when I got off the, the sidewalk, uh, I asked somebody, what's that about? And I said, oh, World's Fair. Didn't you say you like World's Fairs? How come you're not going? And I said, what World's Fair? I said, the one in Scuba. And I said, okay. And it reminded me, I had heard something about a World's Fair coming up uh, at the uh, 84 World's Fair in New Orleans, but I had never had any plans at that point in my life to go to Tokyo. And next thing I know, I'm there. So I said, how far away is it? And it's oh, about an hour by bus. And uh, I said, okay, where do you get tickets? So uh, that night I left work about an hour or two early, got on a bus. Uh, I was very happy that they sent a uh, interpreter out with me because uh, my Japanese, like I said, is near non-existent. Picked up a few words since then, but that first week was was not good. And uh, it's one of those things you always remember. We took this bus ride out there, and they had a, a song playing on the on the uh, bus that it was a, a karaoke version of We Can Work It Out. And they would say, like, oh, if you need a place to eat, we can work it out. If you need a place to stay, it was this tourist company. After an hour of listening to this thing, we can work it out. I never want to hear that song again. But we finally get out there to... Uh, to uh, scuba to uh, X-85 and I was just blown away because again I had no planning or anything when I went to the office that day I had no plan I was going to be at a world's fair that night and it would be like if all of a sudden you, you drove to I don't know rural Pennsylvania and found they had built a Disneyland you know in the middle of the Poconos or something you'd be kind of surprised so uh, it was really interesting that uh, 
t main takeaways I had from it was that uh, it was a, a fair of a lot of movies. Uh, we'll, I'll be going pavilion by pavilion, but a lot of movies. And the big thing was 3D was uh, almost I th almost every movie seemed to be in 3D. And the thing, uh, thing they seemed to go for is who can have the biggest screen. So some people would boast that they had the biggest, uh, tallest screen, others the biggest curved screen, others the biggest dome screen. So a lot of movies. Uh, and what was really interesting was not a lot of it was done in English. So there were some pavilions I went through and the movie would come out and I'd have to ask the interpreter when we got out, what was that all about? Uh, they, they didn't do an awful lot of explaining to the, uh, the Westerners uh, you know, what was going on. But it was really fascinating. It was a, a, a very nice uh, fair in terms of clean grounds. Uh, uh, you'll see it was part of it pretty crowded, but it was uh, kind of fun. So let me get into, uh, let's see, share screen. And I will go and find my PowerPoint. And I will zip it up here to the very beginning. And I, would, I just moved a slide around, so okay. So again, it was uh, this scuba is about an hour, I think it's to the northeast of uh, Tokyo. Uh, now there's a nice train line that runs out there. Back then it was uh, going out by bus, but it wasn't too bad, uh, again, other than that song. The theme of it was science and technology for man at home. Um, kind of an interesting subject when you first see it, what's it going to be? And it turned out not to be just a... Uh, a uh, love fest of uh, the newest home uh, electronic appliances or anything. There was an awful lot in there about uh, nature and how man had to coexist with nature. Um, there was an awful lot there about uh, how the human body works, things like that. So it wasn't just a lot about, you know, things that you might see at home, but it was a lot of science and technology. Just for background, by the way, Scuba uh, City had been built as a planned city, started in 1963, that the Japanese government decided to build this technology center out in the, what was the boondocks at the time, trying to convince technology companies to group together for synergy, that if you put a whole bunch of scientists working near each other, uh, my company might invent something that your company would want to benefit. Uh, they'd been out there uh, 20 years, they decided that uh, Expo 85 would be a great way to uh, increase awareness of their uh, manufactured city and it, it did have that effect. So let's see, a uh, map that you'd get in the uh, tour guide laid out, kind of a, a, a blobby plot stuck out in the middle of the, uh, the city. Unlike many other uh, World's Fairs, they did not have to get rid of an abandoned railroad. They did not have to get rid of uh, any giant waste yards or anything else. Uh, it was pretty much the land that they could build and do what, what as they please. They had maps that you saw like this around the property, and they went to a, uh, what they called blocks. You had an A block, a B block, a C block, and they did them in colors. So uh, you had a, a gray one, a, a kind of orange one, a, a blue one, and a signage for things like the uh, information centers and everything were all themed to the color of that particular block. Um, the signage luckily was in English, so uh, it was easy enough if you wanted to get from A block to B block, the sign would tell you, you can see down below, uh, you know, they had it marked in English and, and in Japanese. So uh, we will hop around and we'll start at A block. And again, this is the sort of things we'll see in A block. They had a mixture of uh, pavilions that were built by individual companies or uh, countries, and they also had ones that were uh, built by the uh, Expo Corporation. So in this particular one, you see eight, nine, and 10. Uh, eight was the United States Pavilion, but nine and 10 were interesting because these were buildings that housed a large number of the international pavilions. And this is where folks that went to the 64 World's Fair may uh, remember that Robert Moses made a horrible tactical error. The Bureau of International Exposition says you're not allowed to charge rent to the international exhibitors Moses decided he would, so most did not come. Here they did exactly what the BIE wants. They built uh, buildings that housed groups of countries, and as a result, you had a tremendous number of international participants, some of them very small. I mean, you look at some of these, Nepal, for example, in this, uh, there were some countries that had never exhibited at World's Fair as before. So it was a very interesting combination of uh, these international displays mixed with these giant industrial ones. And this is just taking a look through the area. Again, what I love about World's Fair is so much, not just the exhibits, but also the uh, architecture of the building. That's the United States uh, Pavilion way in the back. 
and we'll take a hop around. So as I said, I'm not going to go through each of the pavilions, the uh, international pavilions, because they kind of pretty much look the same. They're all in this, this one big building here in this section. Uh, so you'd have Belize, you'd have Brazil, you'd have Costa Rica. They were all in this giant building, but uh, you decorated the outside, put up signage, your national flag or whatever, and you try to have people come in. And they had the sort of displays you might want, uh, you know, expect at these. Uh, why you'd want to come to Costa Rica, what our tourism is, what our uh, uh, economic thing is, what you could buy from us, that sort of thing. So they were all interesting. Again, a lot of them were in Japanese uh, only, so you'd have to walk in and kind of figure out you know, what you're looking at. But it was interesting to, uh, because they did have, uh, in some of these, they did have small snack bars or you know things like that that you could sample the, the where is that area. It was kind of interesting. But most of these things were done by the bigger uh, companies. So kind of interesting, uh, as you can imagine, Japanese companies were all out trying to outdo themselves. So like, just like the 64 ferry had GE trying to outdo uh, you know, General Motors, everything. Well, here you had Hitachi, you had uh, everybody else going uh, in it. As I mentioned, uh, films were a big thing. If you look here, you can see this building is sort of circular. Well, inside you had four screens and an audience that rotated. Uh, sounds like the Carousel of Progress. The difference was the screens, the movies were shown on the outer wall and the inner, uh, you walked in, you sat down in the uh, theater and you rotated, but it was the core of the theater that rotated and took you around to see each of the movies. And there were, uh, each of the movies was five minutes long uh, as you went through it. And it was uh, it was kind of interesting. It was again a, a 3D uh, movie, and almost every film there appeared to be 3D. It was a real big thing. Uh, you also, as you came out of this, there was a exhibit that I remember really well. It was called the uh, Robot Artists, and it was industrial robots. That was another thing that a lot of pavilions had. These two uh, robots would come out, and it was a giant block of ice that was in between them, and the audience was asked to vote for what the uh, uh, robots should carve out of the ice. And uh, they would put up a picture of an elephant and people would yell and cheer. And they'd put up a picture of a, a lion. There. And then they would finally decide who would yell and cheer the loudest. And these robots would just go to work. And it was really spectacular to watch because they were behind this big plexiglass shield and ice chips were just going everywhere. And sometimes right over the uh, uh, wall into the crowd and all the kids would run out and try to grab a piece of ice. But these robots were just going crazy, uh, saws and drills and everything. And they came out at a very passable thing of an elephant or a giraffe or whatever. It was, uh, it was really spectacular to, to, to see. Gas Pavilion was kind of interesting. Uh, it was again, just like the Festival of Gas at the 64 World's Fair why you use gas to heat your home, heat your business. They had a big thing in here about cooking. Uh, so uh, gas was a, a big thing for coming and cooking because in Japan, a lot of people have been still cooking over uh, uh, charcoal, uh, you know, or uh, you know, other fl natural flame sort of things. They were trying to get people used to the idea of uh, gas in their kitchens. One of the things that was interesting was this ball, this orb at the front of it, it's hard to see in this picture, but it's it's lit, and that white sort of thing over the top is actually the gas that's lit up, and it would kind of ripple as the wind blew through the site. Uh, this this thing would uh, take on a kind of undulating shape of uh, the all these little gas jets. So it's just kind of a neat thing to see. And this is a kind of general view. One of the things they had was an awful lot of these shops uh, selling souvenirs all over the place, and. For me, being a World's Fair fan and the souvenir shops, it was a deadly combination. Uh, I had to remember, though, well, everything I get here, I, I have to take back to Australia and New Zealand with me. And my interpreter said, oh, we can mail it back to the States for you. Well, I was a very happy camper with that. But it was just uh, kind of interesting because this is just so typical of the sort of uh, bazaars or markets you might find all over the rest of Japan with uh, everything being sold, not just inside, outside, but lots of colorful banners and things to, uh, to kind of draw you to their shop. Uh, two interesting things here in the background is the Sony Jumbotron. I'll take a look at that a little bit later, but uh, in the front is the HSST, which is a high-speed surface transport, a maglev train. And it was a real big prediction on how uh, trains now, the bullet train and everything else are gonna be replaced with uh, magnetic induction systems. And they were going to float on a cushion of uh, air and not make contact with the ground. 
this was a really tough one to get a, a, a ticket to. Uh, they did it just like a uh, airport, if you remember, old style boarding pass, and you were told what time and where to go for the thing. And it was a kind of uh, neat train. Again, the technology has never taken off to the uh, uh, level that they had hoped to. Uh, you know, it turned out to be a, a very energy uh, inefficient system. It requires a tremendous amount of electricity to actually make it work. But it was uh, kind of neat to go in. Uh, it, it was very short, very short ride. The, lot, the line was far, far longer than the ride itself. But it was still kind of neat to think I'm riding on the train of the future. Hasn't quite gotten here yet, but maybe someday. Uh, we had other pavilions. Uh, again, I, some of these I will have a, a terrible time if I try to pronounce them all, but this is Ibaraka. Uh, this is the prefecture that uh, uh, Scuba City is in. So this was the host uh, county or uh, parish or whatever the U.S. Uh, equivalent would be. And they would try to have people come in to understand why they should move their country, companies to Scuba. It was also a nice area because it, it was uh, air conditioned. It was kind of hot and humid some of the, the time out there. But the pavilion, pavilion had a nice lounge area where they had movies. There's a, a mountain in the area, Mount Scuba, and uh, it would go on about the things were outside and what you could come back and see besides the expo was other tourist things in that particular part of uh, town. Then the Mitsui uh, Water Theater, okay, we have Toshiba we'll come back to on the left, but Mitsui, Mitsui Water Theater was an uh, interesting one. This was, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting to see how many things, um, how many things you saw there that you felt like you had been someplace before. When you went into this one, you went into a car and the car then would uh, detach from the other cars and they were big cars. Uh, it was just like going to the energy pavilion at uh, Epcot. You would go and sit in it and uh, there'd be a movie and then your part of the theater would move, it would go to another theater and uh, take you around on a tour. And at the end they had a, a movie, it was done on a 200 foot uh, high screen of water and it's sort of like what you see if you go to the Disney parks today with Fantasmic. And it was a show all projected against this uh, uh, thing of water. So it was kind of interesting. Another thing that was a, a sort of thing that made you feel like deja vu is that when you first went in, they gave you a whistle and told you, hold on to the whistle. You're going to need it at the end. So the movie involved a, a boy and his robot, a lot of robots at Expo 85. This boy and his robot are out. And uh, they're, they're taking an adventure and they come across a skunk that's drowning in a river and the boy can't reach it. Uh, the river's too wide and raging, but the robot is uh, afraid to go out and into the water. So the boy starts whistling to the robot to give it courage and they ask everybody else to go and take your whistle and start uh, blowing it. So it was sort of like, you know, the, I remember when I first, uh, my first Broadway play ever was uh, Peter Pan. And there was uh, you know, everybody telling you to clap to bring Tinkerbell back to life. Well, we're all blowing whistles like mad to, uh, to get the robot. And the robot did go out and did save the skunks. So everything worked out well there. Uh, this was kind of an interesting one. This was done as a 3D um, a Sumitomo. The effect here did not work as well during the day. At night, it really did look like that yellow uh, box was just kind of floating in air. But inside they had a, a 3D movie, uh, again, 3D everywhere. A uh, young girl and her dog are out taking a walk one day and they just happen to come across a hot air balloon and uh, decide to go for a ride and, and uh, take an adventure around the countryside. And again, all done in 3D. So at night, uh, again, when the, everything was dark and you couldn't see it so much as you came walking down the street, it did look like this cube was just kind of floating in air in, in front of the building. Toshiba, again, uh, this one had a kind of interesting pre-show. It had a giant plotter, uh, the biggest plotter in the world, and it would come in and entertain you as the, everybody else was seeing the main show inside. Uh, this would do a giant uh, drawing out there in uh, multiple colors, and then they would uh, see who could yell the loudest, and they would give them this giant chart to take home. I still don't remember what the chart was they were drawing, but it was a giant plotter. When you went into the theater, it was uh, ShowScan. It's a system developed by uh, Douglas Trumbull that uh, basically projects film at a much faster rate than the usual film rate, which gives you a, a, a very uh, th a high density type of look, a very seamless um, sort of motion. So if in a normal film, I think it's 24 frames per second, you know, your arm would be in 24 separate images. Well, here it's something like 50 or 60, 
So your arm moves at a much slower, uh, much more fluid uh, pace across the uh, screen. Your eye doesn't see the motion as much. So it was a kind of interesting thing. And uh, it was another Boy and His Robot uh, a movie. And uh, at the end of it, we came out and there was a, a exhibit of all the latest Toshiba products, including uh, very early definitions of high density television. Uh, they had a kind of interesting thing back at the Sony pavilion building in downtown Tokyo, where you had what they called your electronic window on the world. It was the first HD TV I'd ever seen. I think it was only something like $12,000. But you would look at this window and uh, they would show, uh, it, it did look like a window with curtains and everything. And you would see outside your window, Niagara Falls. And then it would switch and there would be a, a picture of the Alps and another picture all in HD. And then they had a camera that was out there watching all the people wander around the uh, expo site. Well, Toshiba, of course, now is trying to show off their HD TVs. You couldn't go and buy one of them at the fair. You could come out and look at them. But uh, you could also go and, you know, they, they had the latest in VHS recorders and everything else that they, they were selling at the time. The UCC Coffee Pavilion was, uh, as you can imagine, all about coffee. Not being a coffee drinker, it wasn't uh, one of my, my big ones I spent time at. But you could go into and they talked about how coffee is grown and harvested and you could get a free sample which I remember were very, very small cups. And if you liked it, you could go over to the coffee bar, which would sell you very big cups. But uh, UCC is uh, not a name that we generally know here in the United States, but it has exhibited successfully at a number of uh, Japanese World's Fairs and uh, is very popular with the, uh, the public over there. United States Pavilion. This was kind of a, a disappointing pavilion in, in, in some ways. Uh, the architecture is kind of interesting. It's a suspended ceiling. It's sort of like we had uh, seen earlier Expo 67, the German Pavilion where you put out some uh, poles, you hold up the ceiling by the roof, it gives you a lot of uh, space in, in between. Well, what was kind of disappointing was that it was a pavilion that the United States government said, we don't have money to build a, a exhibits. We're not gonna build exhibits. If anybody wants to exhibit, you gotta exhibit on your own. So they went to companies like Texas Instruments. Matter of fact, uh, for me, this was the Texas Instruments Pavilion. Uh, I think I have a next one's inside, yeah. Everything was computers. Uh, there was some stuff that was interesting. There was the days of um, music synthesizers, and a fellow would sit here, he'd uh, show you how he could click notes on a keyboard, uh, move things around with a very easy, uh, or very early, rather, uh, mouse and uh, a pen sort of combination. And then he would hit the button and the uh, synthesizer would play the song he had just uh, conducted. Or he could go to a keyboard, he could play something, and then the system would instantly play it back again because they had recorded it. But it was really basically, that was it. Computer technology, there was, I was very disappointed. You know, like I mentioned earlier, you go to Costa Rica, Belize or wherever, there was a lot there on why you would want to come to their country. I can't recall anything whatsoever in the United States Pavilion that would tell anybody from Japan why they would want to have come to the United States. It was purely what you could buy from the United States, uh, what we're going to sell you. Um, you know, it, it was really disappointing. There was a movie, I think it ran about 12 minutes, it ran nonstop that uh, uh, did have a little bit of that. Uh, but for the, the displays themselves, it, to me, it was really disappointing and a very tacky thing. I, I wanted to come out of there and practice uh, speaking like a Canadian when people asked me when I was from. And I had a lot of people ask me from where I was from because as you'll see in these pictures, you don't see very many Western faces. When you came out, there was the American gift shop garden. Uh, in the back, you could see some of the participating uh, companies that were there. DuPont, Japan, Polaroid, Texas Instrument, TRW. Again, a very technology uh, oriented pavilion. Um, not one that was uh, anywhere near like what we had seen at say Expo 67, where it was really about American history. You know. The, uh, the American culture sort of thing. They had, you know, 60, Expo 67, a big thing about Hollywood, the big thing about the American elections, about, you know, uh, American dolls and toys and that. Here was all about electronics. But outside, again, off to the right is one of the information booths. As I mentioned, everything was kind of color-coded. They were really big on pictographs, so you could kind of see that it was a question mark. If you had a question, come over and, uh, you know, talk to us. Uh, a lot of the other shops outside uh, selling souvenirs, uh, we're going to go into B Block now. And again, the 
same sort of thing. You had uh, the buildings in the center, uh, well, 12, 13, uh, 11, 12, 13, and 14 are the national pavilions. Uh, not the same sort of design necessarily as we had seen in the A block, but a bunch of the uh, uh, foreign uh, pav uh, pavilions in the center and the, uh, the ones around it. So we'll take a hop around here. Australia was uh, interesting because they had a lot about why you'd want to come to Australia. They had a lot more space than some of the other international exhibits. And one of the big reasons was they were getting ready to host Expo 88. So you can see off on the right hand wall, uh, some of these symbols uh, that are known for Expo 88. You could go and get your picture taken uh, and over there, sticking your face through the uh, center. But inside they had a model of Expo 88, uh, why you would come to Brisbane, why you'd like to see it. And it was a, a, a big eye opener for a lot of people as far as, you know, Japan is not all that far, it's, uh, you know, eight hour flight or something. So they, they, they got to think a lot of advanced business or interest out of it. Belgium was also interesting. They were, had not had a upcoming World's Fair, but they had had a prior World's Fair. So I really got a kick out of this uh, uh, topiary figure of the uh, uh, Tomium uh, sculpture, the theme structure from the uh, Expo 58. It was kind of neat to see that growing there. And again, I won't go to all the international pavilions because they were all in one giant uh, building that was pretty much the same, but they would, again, decorate the outside. You'd go in. And inside, if you were in the uh, UK, the Great Britain Pavilion, there was a thing here. They were just expanding the, the tube out to uh, Heathrow and that. Uh, actually, I think it might have already been open by then, but the whole big display about the underground, there was things about British cars, that sort of thing. Or you could go over to France and they were all into, uh, you could get the latest perfume or, or scarves or that sort of thing. So again, you can see what they did with the interior space of their pavilions to try to personalize it and make it unique. The EC, now we know as the uh, European uh, Union, uh, back then the, Europe, the uh, European community, this was the whole idea of getting everybody together, take down the national borders, take down tariffs. Uh, so this was explaining how everybody would be coming together in one giant European community to benefit uh, all and for their uh, technology and for their, uh, you know, their free trade. Ujitsu, one of the uh, Japanese companies, uh, very interesting sort of a kinetic sculpture up at the top there like we had seen at the uh, Festival of Gas back in uh, 60, uh, I'm sorry, the Tower of Light back at the 64 World's Fair. Um, as you walked in, almost all these pavilions had a pre-show to kind of entertain you while you were waiting for the main event. This particular one was kind of interesting. You would write uh, something out in uh, handwriting and they would stick it into an optical scanner and then they would translate it into other languages. So they would have uh, people, uh, you know, write down their, their name, their hometown on a piece of paper, put it in and then it would announce where they were from. And then uh, <laughs> they would come and say, oh, look, there's somebody that's not from Japan, you know, and to, uh, had me write something down that wrote, you know, Bill Cotter, Los Angeles, and it, it translated. So they wanted to prove that their scanner could read English, it could read, you know, katakana, kanji, all these different uh, character sets. So it was kind of interesting. Then you went inside, there was a giant dome they call it the Cosmos Dome, and it had a, a 3D film. This one was unique because it was all 3D, uh, computer-generated 3D. <coughs> Excuse me. So again, you went in, it was a, built as a, a giant science fiction adventure, uh, and you had a um, uh, powerful robot inside. But when you came out of the 3D film, they had this giant robot that was, uh, it was massive, it really was. And they would show you how powerful the Fujitsu robot was because it would do uh, curls of a 200-pound barbell, then they would put it down and they would assemble a very intricate small uh, model of itself to show that it could handle massive weights, but also assemble things down to millimeters of uh, accuracy. So it was kind of uh, interesting to see. Uh, move on here. Oh, this is the line, for example, waiting to get in there. Uh, the, the, these pavilions were very popular. A uh, lot, then people very orderly. It was a very uh, well uh, behaved uh, experience. Never had any problems with line cutting or anything like that. But it was uh, lots of people waiting to go see the, these things. The Fuyu group was kind of interesting. It was a robotic show where uh, basically a, I think, matter of fact, the next one's a picture of it. They had these robot figures that would come out. Uh, the boy and the girl are, are part of the cast, but the robots would come out onto the stage and they would do a uh, basically a robotic ballet. Uh, they had a 
robot that would come out at the beginning and, and clean the floor and uh, tell you how everything was getting ready. And then uh, as music played, robots would come dancing out of those heart-shaped uh, curtain areas behind you. They'd come out and do like a, a square dance sort of routine or uh, you know other things. Again, I had to have somebody explain to me what the theme of it was at the end. But it was all robotic controlled and uh, their example again about what you can do with uh, technology that this entire stage show could be done, choreographed and performed without any human interaction other than the performers who are waving to you. IBM had a pavilion, uh, as you can imagine what was inside there, the latest, greatest computers. Uh, IBM Japan being a separate subsidiary than IBM United States, most of the emphasis was here on how they had adopted uh, computers to handle uh, Japanese language also Chinese language, uh, you know, word processing, that sort of thing was, uh, it's hard to believe things like word processing were still just taking off in uh, 1985, but it was a, a big thing. And uh, again, it, it, they had a database just like other world's fairs, you could put a date in, it would tell you things that had happened at that date sort of thing. Uh, this particular one, uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember which pavilion this was. Uh, maybe I have another picture coming up. Sometimes I confuse myself. Well, okay, we'll go into uh, into this one here. Um, let's see. This was the one with the uh, the stage show. No, this was. The, I'm, I'm looking at some notes I made. I I should have put the titles on on what the bottom of these things were. Um, well, well, let's see. This was a. a oh, I remember. This the boy. Uh, he goes in there uh, and he gets uh, exposed to the brain of a young girl. So they they basically show you how they can go into the human brain, how synapses fire, how the thought processes work, the difference between logic, emotion, that, that sort of thing. This was one of the few ride systems they had at the uh, uh, fair. Uh, you got in this uh, Kuramakin, I uh, think, what do they call them, uh, space uh, riders. Uh, yeah, space rider, that was right, I remembered it. It was the history of the wheel. So you got in it and you went through this uh, tunnel and went up to the top. And they had a whole thing about the history of the wheel and, and how it was used for, you know, uh, basic carts. And then it got into wagons and went into steam trains. And the company was very heavily involved in doing uh, modeling of uh, uh, new cars, uh, prototypes. So for car fans, as you walked in, there were all these cars that looked like they were right out of uh, Blade Runner, that sort of thing. And again, one of the very few ride systems that was uh, actually there. Most of the fair was movies. This was kind of unique because it took you up through this tunnel and then gave you the show. Uh, Matsui was here, uh, Matsushita rather, was here, but they went under their brand name of Panasonic. So uh, they had a, a show where you had some AA audio animatronic figures talking about history. Uh, it was some of the very few, I'm trying to remember any other pavilions that had AA humans. Some of them had birds in that, but you went in and they talked about Japanese history and how it led to the creation of the company and the technology, how things had improved. And then they had a kind of interesting thing where they had a portrait robot where they would pick somebody out. The robot would uh, scan you with uh, basically taking a picture of you and then would translate you into a uh, piece of art. And it took about 60 seconds or so that this art painting uh, robot would do a very nice uh, painting of, of somebody, uh, then another sheet of paper would drop out, another person sat down, got their picture taken. But it was kind of interesting to see just how fast the thing could process from the time the person sat at the screen to the time that uh, they were actually able to walk out of their, their, their souvenir picture. And again, you could then see all the latest Panasonic products. Uh, they were big into bread makers and uh, VCRs and TVs and that. Uh, here again is another uh, pavilion. Uh, this particular one had this message board uh, that you could come in uh, getting near the end of Expo 85 at this, this particular time. But it was, it was just kind of fascinating all the, the architecture, the different styles of everything that there was to see. We're in now the History Pavilion, which was one of the pavilions built by the Japanese government. They had the History Pavilion, they had a theme structure and all. And this was a 2000 year old piece of cypress tree that uh, was there. And uh, it was basically to show that, you know, man is temporary, nature lives on. And this thing had been around for years and years, longer than any of us. And even though it had the tree had died, that on its own, it was still a beautiful uh, you know, piece of nature. And uh, it was kind of uh, presented in a sort of reverential setting, which was kind of interesting. Uh, the steel pavilion, uh, 
you can imagine what that was, all the things you could do with steel, how you could build steel buildings, steel is used in cars, steel is used all throughout your homes. Again, they had an awful lot of uh, Japanese housing had not been using steel, and now they're trying to tell them to use steel because it's much safer for earthquakes than some of the traditional uh, masonry or wood timber construction. And inside, this is the uh, interior of it, big open space that steel lets you do all these wonderful things. Switzerland, I got a real kick out of this one because uh, I walked around the corner, came and saw this, this faucet going, and it reminded me so much, uh, I'd seen this uh, at the Culligan exhibit at the 64 World's Fair, and it turns out it's shown up at a number of World's Fairs. But I remember as a 12-year-old kid, just being fascinated seeing this pipe sitting there in the, in, the water, in the air with no water going into it, but all the water pouring on out. So I just, I got a real kick. I took this my first night when I was out there when I, I had not planned on going out. I, luckily I had my camera with me, but I, I didn't have much film. So, and I didn't have a lot of money with me because I wasn't really planning on going to World's Fair. But I, one of my shots I took that night was I had to get a picture of this, uh, this faucet. Silliness, but it took me back to 1964. I was a kid again, I enjoyed it. Uh, TDK had an interesting one where you went into it and you would more, uh, go through metamorphosis and you would become either a bird or an insect. And they would take you through uh, showing what the, uh, how lo life looks so differently uh, from their point of view. So um, it was uh, basically a, a stage show that they had at the end, but this film would take you through and try to uh, you know, dart around quickly like a bird or an insect would, showing you, uh, you know, what their view of the world is. Again, more of the, the shops, um, just kind of interesting to me how many, many, many different ways there were to, uh, to buy things. Off to the left, you can see some storage lockers. I made uh, good use of those. I then had to remember where the hell the storage locker was that I was putting everything in. And I thank goodness I had some very patient interpreters with me. Uh, they also had picnic grounds. You could come out, grab a bite to uh, eat. You could bring in your own meals, or there were lots of uh, small snacks sh shops to go to. There were a lot of McDonald's restaurants. There were all sorts of Japanese food, of course, uh, at the go. But it was nice, a shaded area. You could go and get something to eat. C Block was uh, kind of a very small one, not an awful lot there. The, a lot of the uh, stuff in here you can see was uh, support sort of thing, banks, post offices, interpreters, tourist information center. But uh, this is what you might see when you came to uh, get to the fair. They put in a lot of gates and a lot of turnstiles at the gates. They had uh, learned from the folks that had done other World's Fairs uh, that uh, it was very important to get as many people in as fast as possible uh, to create a, a great environment. So they really went way out of their way. And other pictures I have show this area absolutely mobbed. But they could have this thing backed up with people 150 deep and have everybody into the fair in about a six minute window. It was, it was amazing how fast they moved people through it. So it was, uh, it was well received. Inside, everybody would get in and run right past the United Nations. It was uh, the dome in the back, the only the real exhibit in C Block. And it was uh, about the history of the United Nations, the peacekeeping or, uh, parts of it. Uh, things like UNICEF, uh, uh, things they were trying to do as far as promoting uh, better agricultural programs, uh, particularly in Africa at the time, but it, uh, it did not get a lot of traffic. Post office, uh, being a stamp collector, I had to go and I had to get some stamps. Uh, I really enjoyed it. And this was kind of an interesting thing they had. This, this robot here, uh, not robot, mailbox was for 2001. The idea was that you would come and uh, uh, write yourself a, uh, a letter. It was a very special uh, piece of stationary you had to buy, you would address it to yourself, put it in there, and 16 years later in 2001, they would uh, email, uh, not email, they would mail you the letter. So um, I'm still waiting for mine. We know the post office is running a little late. Uh, it turned out later I found out they were only delivering it in Japan because they had no idea what international postage was going to be in 2001, but they made special stamps for a Japanese delivery. But I got a real kick out of the, the little happy uh, mailbox sitting there eating all the letters. They also had bank inside who could go and get some money, which when I found that out, I was happy because now I could buy more souvenirs. And then again, lots of, lots of opportunity to buy stuff. Um, I was there getting over there near the end of the fair, so everybody was having a sale. D block was kind of more the open area, this large uh, lake in the uh, center and uh, a lot of green space in it. So it was a very nice, tranquil sort of spot. You had a sky ride, seems to be uh, mandatory for World's Fairs, so you could get on it and take a, a trip across the fairground. 
Uh, or you could come by and we see the track up here for the monorail system. I'll come back to that. This was the Expo th uh, Theater that was there. Uh, it was basically a uh, open air amphitheater with a roof over its head, which was kind of nice. It kept people out of the, the sun. And you can see the seating, some people walking across the white area seating and that down below. They had a lot of stage shows, a lot of entertainment. I skipped most of it because I didn't know what was going on. I also had a very limited time. and I wanted to see the uh, exhibits, but when you went by on the monorail or on the Skyway, you could hear it coming up. They also had a very nice garden area out there, uh, you know, water but just bubbling places, rocks you could sit on, again, places to relax and get away from the hustle and bustle. Sony was showing, uh, they had the uh, Sony Jumbotron, huge TV. Uh, this was back before they were in most sports stadiums or anything like that. So uh, they would come out and they had a, a, a stage, um, not a stage show, a, a, a video show, and then they would show movies and travel things on it at night. So lots of people coming out here at night to watch the beginning of the show. Down below was McDonald's. My tour guide was horrified that I wanted to eat at McDonald's one, one time. And it was not that I missed the food, it was that it was fast and I wanted to see more of the fare. So she, uh, as my wife knows, that's not uncommon. I'll, I'll eat anything fast to keep going. But this again, the view of the, the nighttime area over in the background is a children's amusement area, lots of uh, you know, neon lights and that, but also kind of a peaceful area to walk through at night with the lights around the, the lake and that. It was very uh, tranquil and kind of uh, set off in the hustle and bustle of the rest of the fair, which was very loud and boisterous. E Block, again, the theme pavilion was built by the Japanese government, so was the history pavilion. Uh, we will uh, t go jumping around there. Again, everything color-coded, so this area was gray. Uh, in the center there, you had a giant uh, thing of uh, the Japanese islands, sort of like their version of the Texaco maps in the 64 fair, of everything laid out in a, a giant map that you could walk across. The circular uh, device off to the center is a sundial that uh, I could never figure out when I was looking at how it was working. But theoretically, the sun came through it and shone at a target, and you could tell what time it was. Um, Again, theory, that was, that was the concept. But you had some kind of neat things. They invited everybody to go in through this tunnel and it was mostly for kids, but of course adults had to go in and do it. And you went into this tunnel and you'd walk across these nets and bouncing and everything. But they had a, a kind of interesting thing where uh, one part of the tunnel would be very foggy. I mean, so foggy you could barely see what was going through it. Another part was very, very windy. Another part, the water was pouring around down outside it uh, didn't actually get you wet, but you'd swear looking you were going to get soaked. So it was just kind of an interesting playground. And they challenged you, you know, to see, did you want to run through it fast? Did you want to go through it slow or whatever? And it was kind of a, a neat little exhibit. History Pavilion, like I said, I, I realized another slide, the cedar tree is off uh, 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 out of sequence needs to be in here. But they had all sorts of things about how electricity first came to Japan for some of the first electric dynamos that they had done there. These water wheels were in motion. They were showing how water had powered old mills and uh, that sort of thing. Lots of uh, different examples of old Japanese technology. Wayne Brettel might uh, appreciate this. He's an ancient uh, TV fan. This was uh, one of the first TVs sold in Japan at the time. Uh, now having a computer generating uh, an image of a character on it. And again, looking at this, the theme structure, we're at the Fujitsu Pavilion looking over towards the theme structure, which was a large tower that you could go up to the top and get a nice view of the uh, uh, grounds. You can see some people out looking at the windows up there. And it had two halls off to either side of it. Uh, inside, you had the uh, robot here, the Watsubot robot. Uh, it played the uh, synthesizers, and it had actually played at the opening ceremonies for Expo 85. They came out and played the Expo 85 theme song and then continually played in the pavilion uh, over and over. There had been a uh, series of Japanese music playing robots and this was the latest in that particular series. And it was uh, being touted as a real example of, of uh, you know, how the robots are still gonna be uh, servants to us, but they're also gonna be able to entertain us. And this is one of the halls. Again, uh, you had technology halls. I like this one because uh, my uh, interpreter liked this. We did eat in here and did have a Japanese meal. But it was nice, again, to get in and out of the uh, 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 heat. It's funny the things you can remember. I can remember this hall 
so well because it was air conditioned. I was able to sit because we were going. We didn't stop. We just moved, moved, moved through this fair. And it was really nice to take a few minutes and just sit down and re uh, relax. Uh, outside, you had a lot of kinetic sculptures in this children's plaza area. This one off to the left. They just moved back and forth, uh, up and down, and, and uh, there were small uh, replicas of them you could buy and, and take home. Uh, there's their monorail, very different looking from uh, the monorails we've generally seen of uh, big cars and a track. This is sort of more like the, uh, uh, the little uh, systems at Expo uh, 67 where you had people going through in small uh, compartments. And they had another TV. Uh, Sony had the Jumbotron, but uh, they also had this TV at the Children's Plaza. And you can see if you're in trouble, ask a companion for help. They had a lot of people going around the site uh, basically in uh, uniforms that if you needed help, you could go and you know, get the you know, directions, that sort of thing. One of the neat things about this TV was that it, this was a giant water fountain in front of it. So those guards are standing out there. They're getting ready to clear the area off because they're going to be warning people that the um, water is going to start jumping out of jets out there. And they had uh, the water synchronized to videos that were shown on the large screen TV. So kids could, could be running out, their favorite Japanese anime characters were jumping up on the screen, uh, everything uh, choreographed, and kids were going out there just getting absolutely soaked. We're off to F Block. Uh, you can see off to the left is a uh, amusement area, some uh, more pavilions in the uh, center. Again, uh, four and five are where a lot of the uh, uh, international pavilions are. And again, this is a look at that area. Uh, and again, for me, I, I just loved it. The colors of the balloons, the awnings, the shapes of the buildings. Uh, the building over to the right is one of the ones that held more of the uh, multiple international pavilions. Again, a temporary structure built by the Fair Corporation, but everybody customizing their p particular pieces of it. So the South Pacific Pavilion, um, you had uh, you know palm trees outside, displays of coconuts, everything to lure you inside. Uh, again, oh, here now we're into the Electric Industries uh, Pavilion. I think that was the exact name. Uh, electric Power, yeah. This was a, a ride where you did get through and they shrunk you down. Uh, it was called the Electro Gulliver Ride. And it was what you'd see if you had gone like to Gulliver to the land of the Lilliputians. They would uh, take you around and you would see things from, again, a microscopic sort of uh, viewpoint. This was called Technocosmos. It was the largest Ferris wheel in the world at the time. 85 meters tall, uh, 85 being picked obviously to go with uh, Expo 85. And each of those cars uh, handled uh, eight passengers going around. And it, it, it did give a spectacular uh, view of the fair. And amazing of the line for it wasn't very long. It, it moved at a pretty good clip and they were very uh, efficient as far as their loading and unloading. And again, just a, a different example looking at the, the uh, cabins head on. There's a view again of the amusement area. They had a roller coaster. They had a couple odds and ends. I didn't really go over there because I figured I could go to most roller coasters or things someplace else, but you know, saw and just got a, a glimpse of it. And again, another view of the, the children's entertainment uh, area. This was kind of interesting. Uh, it's, I will mispronounce it. It's D-A-I-E-I, D-A-I-E-I. It was basically called the home of the poet. Uh, on the outside of the pavilion, uh, you would be able to sit on these, uh, uh, the, the roof basically and just relax and look around at the plaza down below. Or if you went inside, they had the poet's dome and it was uh, something to try to make you, uh, there's probably some telemarketer if you hear it ringing. You would go in inside and they had uh, soap bubbles coming out of the ceiling or fog coming and, and everything done to try to uh, put you in a mood or a setting that you, very different from what you just walked in from the outside world. And then they had a movie of uh, very relaxing, tranquil scenes as poetry was read. And again, I, I didn't understand it being in Japanese, but it was to make you relax and put you uh, in the mindset of a poet and to take you out of the world of technology. And, uh, and again, I didn't understand it, but I was very impressed by the, uh, the setting. The, uh, the theater was kind of interesting. Uh, and you never knew what was going to come out next. More jets of, uh, you know, fog or, or bubbles or that sort of thing. It was kind of, kind of neat. Uh, the Technocosmos off uh, in the center to the right is the uh, USSR Pavilion. Uh, inside, uh, did not unfortunately get a good picture of it. It didn't come out real well, but they had a mock-up of the uh, Mir space station 
uh, docked with a uh, Soyuz capsule, and uh, they later uh, showed it at uh, X-86 in Vancouver. But uh, very hardcore industrial pavilion, just like the United States. We were showing uh, technology for computers. They were showing uh, jet engines, turbines, uh, uh, mining equipment, grinding equipment. Uh, again, I don't remember much there saying why you would want to come to the USSR. It was all about why you would want to buy USSR te technology. You can also see that there. this is one of the main blocks uh, where the international pavilions are. They did have a very small tourism office that was separate from the industrial part. So in some cases, you had uh, multiple exhibits for uh, areas. Okay. Click on, we'll go to the G block. G was kind of interesting. I, I really got a kick out of some of what was in G. Again, the blue pavilions are the national pavilions. Again, all sorts of different ones that you don't see in a lot of other uh, world's fairs. Uh, again, this is an example of that custom block. You had Korea. They had a huge display. I think it was over 100 TVs inside uh, in Korea. And the, again, you walk in, they'd be showing you Korean history and also Korean technology. Again, this is all South Korea, zero mention whatsoever. North Korea just did not exist at all uh, in terms of this fair. Islamic Republic of Iran, uh, it was interesting. These women came out and did a dance routine dressed in the outfits that covered them all but their, their face. One thing I mentioned earlier at the beginning of it, they didn't have a um, railroad yard that they had to uh, disguise, but they had a high tension line that ran right through the middle of the site just like they had, uh, we had seen at uh, Expo or the uh, New Orleans World's Fair, couldn't get rid of it. So uh, rather than try to, uh, you know, uh, just ignore it, it was very nice. They painted these towers up where they glowed at night. They really lit them up in a very nice lighting scheme. You could see up on the uh, upper platform some of the spotlights that are pointing up. And then they put uh, these, these kind of walls down at the bottom. You didn't see the, uh, the bolts holding everything to the ground. But at night, it was very nice that they were lit up and kind of gave you a, a, a sense of, uh, oh, I don't know, you'd say uh, transporting across the site as the lights moved uh, in, in across there. NEC was interesting. Uh, they put in this whole gigantic satellite dish out here to uh, kind of show you what, uh, you know, they were all about, how they could get uh, technology and, and satellite communications from around the world. Thing was truly massive, uh, very impressive to walk around. Uh, Midori uh, here was a five screen uh, theater, uh, basically one screen in the center, uh, then uh, smaller ones uh, around it. It was very much like uh, how IBM had done their pavilion at the 64 World's Fair, but things would move from screen to screen, and they showed what was built as a science fiction fantasy, and uh, again, uh, multimedia things. And unfortunately, that's the problem with these things. Even if you were able to show these films today, it'd be next to impossible to do it the way that they had been done at Expo 85 because you had all these giant screens, multiple screens. It was, it was something you really had to uh, experience in person there. Suntory so was kind of interesting. They had a uh, zoo of uh, audio animatronic birds, 200 of them. Here's the entrance going in, a little bit more of how the pavilion looked. But you went in and these uh, 200 mechanical birds would sing and talk, sort of like the tiki birds at uh, the Disney parks. And then you went into uh, what they call the water jet ballet. And it was a flat screen uh, that water would come out and project at various heights to give it a 3D contoured effect of different things occurring out on the, uh, the screen. Uh, and then after you finished that, what did you do? Of course, you went into another very large screen theater for another presentation. This was one I really got a kick out of. Uh, uh, again, I'm horrible in pronounce, pronouncing things. I just can't even pronounce pronouncing. But this was uh, the Shushisha Pavilion, if I get that anywhere near right, was a collage of ancient runes. Uh, so you see all sorts of things, a giant Olmec head at the bottom right, uh, things that were done on the uh, Jap uh, temples in Egypt, uh, Aswan Dam flooded, so that sort of thing. And when you went inside, they had a very large screen uh, theater in there that showed in uh, life-size uh, what a lot of these things would look like if you were there. So you might see, we're going to hop from Stonehenge. We're going to now uh, go over to the Aswan Valley. We're going to go over here. So uh, awful lot of things that were done. And it, this building was absolutely spectacular. It looked, you would have sworn it was carved out of real stone. Uh, it, just standing in front of it and looking at it, uh, it was one of my favorite 
pavilions at the fair just because it was so absolutely crazy and unique. You'll never see another building like this in the real world, but it was amazingly uh, beautifully executed. Again, kind of an example of the, the amount of detail that went into it. Next door, you went from the ancient world to the high world. Uh, here, a computer could analyze your golf swing, could tell you the optimum way to ride a bicycle. Uh, the, uh, they had all sorts of things on how they could analyze performers and says for sw Olympic swimming, things like that, or how you could get a uh, uh, things that ta we take as common today, but who had a treadmill in the house in 1985? The Holman Sports Pavilion was talking about how you could do these things and exercise at home year round. Uh, down at the end, another uh, particular ride. Uh, this one, you went in these uh, cars and this thing would tilt uh, back and forth. It was, so it was uh, sort of like a uh, uh, pseudo uh, Ferris wheel that didn't quite get all the way up there, but uh, it was kind of interesting. And uh, uh, they had, again, telecom land. We were going to go and show you how everything was going to be great. We were going to go and, uh, you know, just revolutionize the world with everything that was going to be done with telecom. Uh, the Birds Theater was kind of interesting one. Uh, Hartopia, you would uh, see it. This, oh, I thought I had another picture. You basically, you went in and you went up to the top and then you looked down and it was, uh, again, the Bird's Eye Theater uh, was showing you what you would see if you were a bird. So you were looking down at screens below your feet. You were about 10, 12 feet above the screen looking down and you'd fly over uh, landmarks that are familiar to us on the ground, but they would show how different they would look to a, a bird up in the sky. So kind of interesting technology. Expo Hall was a general purpose uh, hall that uh, different groups would come in, perform in, sort of a, a catch-all sort of area. They didn't have very many sculptures at the uh, fair. Um, the, this was the freedom of something. I forget the exact name off the top of my head. We had those kinetic sculptures, but this one uh, was often a garden by itself. And it kind of reminded me of the uh, sculpture that was at the heart of Expo 70, just the, the style of it. Okay. Let's, again, uh, information booth, one of the gates area behind it. They try to make it kind of interesting and uh, easy to find your gate. Each gate had a physically different shape, physically different color so that when you went out, hopefully you ended up at the right lot where your bus was or your car was or your train was. But again, it was they made it for fairly easy to find your way around the site. And there was all sorts of stuff for sale. You know, uh, again, all sorts of silliness. Now, Scuba Expo Center was uh, part of Expo, but it was uh, off the main site. This was a, the area that had originally been built back in 63. Uh, and then added on, and this was the industrial part. So they were trying to get you to come over. It was a very interesting walkway, lots of little booths and displays along the way, and you got over there. And this was the uh, the major complex the uh, for the government uh, of the area at the time. Walking on the way over there, as I mentioned, this was a display about dinosaurs. Uh, again, keeps kids busy explaining that uh, dinosaurs, you could go off to these little pavilions off to the side and see some things. Uh, when you got inside, there was a model of what the whole uh, expo site looked like. And you could go in, they had different exhibits there, urban life, how things are going to be better with technology, things are going to move ahead. And the big plaza out front, again, it was not meant as a real World's Fair attraction, but it was the uh, host city to the fair and uh, the reason the whole city had been built in the first place and some kind of interesting sculptures in a garden out there. Now we'll take a few last views around. This was the mascot, uh, Cosmo Hashimaru. Uh, it was designed by a high schooler who had been, uh, uh, they had a contest asking people to come up with the uh, uh, mascot for the, uh, the fair. And it was a combination of an alien and a planet with uh, uh, orbital rings around him. So uh, he was out there wandering around the fairgrounds from time to time. And he was plastered on every sort of merchandise that you could imagine. Super cute little character. Uh, they brought a lot of school kids in for uh, tours of the fair, and you could see all their bicycles. So they would very common to see, you know, hundreds of kids coming, parking their bikes, and it's really interesting. These bikes, none of them are locked up. You didn't need to do that. You just came, put your bike down, went to the, uh, you had your day trip to the fair, came back, and your bike would be there. Uh, this was an uh, exhibit they were having uh, for uh, uh, the uh, two millionth of visitors that had come out to the fair. So they had a couple different mascots uh, out there to uh, welcome them in. 
this lady here with all the lays around her head walked through the gate, a big uh, orange, uh, it was gold colored ball popped open, confetti poured down, and she was now thrilled to be the uh, visitor, uh, the guest visitor. They had a parade that went through every night. These were just kind of parked uh, off back. I didn't get any good night pictures of it, but uh, it was done with lots of strobe lighting and electronic synthesized music. Uh, interpreter Center, my uh, guide joked that she would like to go in there and get a, a job because now after she had learned so much about Expo, because it was her first time there as well, she was one of the uh, secretaries at my office. She uh, was joking that she'd like to go get a job there because she had such a good time. You could get your passport stamped. Unfortunately, I didn't have a passport. I had only bought a day ticket, so I didn't. I don't have an Expo uh, 85 passport full of stamps. This was kind of interesting. Outside the U.S. Pavilion, uh, Fast Pass. We all know about going to a Disney park today and getting a Fast Pass to come back at a particular time. Uh, the first Fast Pass that I know of was at uh, 64 World's Fair, where IBM gave them out which you could go and get a fast pass for a show here at Expo 85, walk up, put your passport in it, and it would tell you when to come back. Also, they had all the uh, restaurants and everything, but they still had, uh, you know, vending machines all over the place stacked around. And uh, I got a kick out of, uh, like, the one here, Pepsi, that you could also, in one half of the machine, you could buy a nice uh, Pepsi, and the other half, you could get a Nescafe coffee. So uh, different things we didn't have at home. Again, the sign sort of explanatory. They sold a lot of postage stamps uh, to, uh, you know, pay the money for things, and they put in lighting facilities for it. Again, here's the, that sculpture I mentioned earlier. And again, uh, Randy Lopez on the uh, call. I think Randy would recognize this sort of style from uh, Expo 70. And again, this is not me, uh, or not my tour guide with the souvenirs, but it just showed some people were buying even more stuff than I did. So that's a look at Expo 85. I will, uh, again, for uh, folks that are new, uh, worldsfairphotos.com, I will put the link to this talk up there on the uh, site. All the other ones are there. I will stop the share. And let me see what we have here for comments, okay? Okay, uh, let's see. We have had some problems with Zoom crashes. Would you mind telling us what interests you do in this presentation? Uh, that was me, Bill. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. That, oh, so you're saying to somebody in the waiting room. Okay. Yeah, yeah. great. Uh, when did the U.S. stop sponsoring Expo Fair participation? It was really after uh, the New Orleans World's Fair that they said, we're not going to do this anymore. They had already made a commitment to Expo 85 that they were going to build the building. But after that, they said, anything you're going to go off and do, you're going to have to start getting private uh, donations to do it. So it was just recently that the U U.S. Uh, rejoined the BIE. They had stopped paying their dues. The BIE carried them for a number of years, finally chucked them out, and then uh, they, they've let them back in. But that's why almost all the uh, pavilions lately have been done, uh, funded by, uh, by private money. Okay, let's see. Uh, two parts of the U.S. pavilion, the corporate... Uh, and theater and the theme, uh, let's see, I'm just scrolling down here. Yeah, uh, Stephen said there were two parts of the U.S. Pavilion, the corporate and theater pavilion, the theme pavilion, which explored computing and AI. And then, yeah, that's pretty much my memory of it as well. That I don't remember anything, and maybe uh, you do, Stephen, as far as, uh, uh, you know, uh, travel or anything else like that along the way. I don't think, uh, Stephen, do you remember anything of it? Uh, yes, I do. I, I worked on it, actually. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, you're right about the, uh, the funding. There wasn't much funding for the uh, <clears throat> theme pavilion side of it, where they had the AI exhibit. Um, so they, it's a combination of interactives and uh, audiovisual. All the inter interactives were a little bit unrealistic because of the crowds that were coming through, it's hard to stop and do those things. But one of the things that uh, I remember that intrigued me was the, uh, the guides. They were American uh, college students who spoke uh, Japanese, they were Japanese majors. And for a lot of people that visited the fair, uh, it was their first encounter with an American, you know, people that came from rural areas. So it was really a fun to see the communication between them, you know, that they could talk and uh, and share share uh, ideas. 
Yeah, it was, it was interesting because I, I had a couple of times people would come up and want to talk to me and he didn't want to be rude, but you wanted to go see the fair and, you know, people would, uh, you know, I, I, I can remember somebody coming up to me uh, at a different time. I was in Japan. I was walking across a, a street, people everywhere. And somebody came in and, you know, made a big thing. They needed to talk to me. And I, I said, you know, uh, can I help you? And I said, you know, uh, are you from America? And I said, yes. Yeah. So, oh, you, you must know my friend, Don Lancaster. <laughs> no, you know, do you have any idea how big America is? These people were so fascinated. We went on, an, I think it was the same trip. Yeah, it was the same trip. We went out to Tokyo Disneyland and there was a fellow that worked for me, a bot, guy named Bob, big, tall British fellow. He was about six one or so, and a big guy, and very blonde, almost white hair. And we were walking through Disneyland, and all these kids were just staring at him, you know. And and you know, I mean, he was like getting a little freaked out by it. And he said, "Hey, hey Bill, you know a little Japanese. What are they saying?" And I said, "Oh, I said that he's trying to figure out how they're going to make an ascent up the north face of you." They, I mean, he was so big, <laughs> and these kids were all looking up. And poor Bob, he just felt like he was a, in a freak show or something. But yeah, I, I got a real kick out of you know. Uh, you think about Japan. My father actually worked for a Japanese company, and he had been over there a lot. And he actually spoke Japanese uh, to a, a minimal level that he could get by in business meetings and that. And he had told me, he says, when you go over there, just get used to the fact that people are going to be staring at you. And they weren't staring at you rude or anything. You know, it was just a lot of curiosity. And then, uh, you know, when you say, oh, I, I you know, live in Los Angeles and, oh, do you work in Hollywood? Have you said that? Yes. Uh, you know, was, they just wanted to talk about everything that went on in Hollywood mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and again, you, you know, I like to say, I'd love to talk to you, but I got to go see that pavilion over there. But uh, yeah, it was... Uh, it was kind of fascinating. There were so many people. And it, uh, like I said, if you look around the pictures, you don't see a lot of many Western faces at all, do you? That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And and Bill, a yeah, Wayne. Um, one thing you haven't talked about uh, in most of your, of your presentations was uh, the ambience uh, in terms of music or anything like that. It, it, any of these fairs have uh, ambient music playing? You know, I don't remember much. It's funny. I was just cleaning up my library yesterday, and I came across the giant tape reels of the ambient music from the 64 fair, so uh, kind of apropos. Mostly what I remembered about uh, the Japan fair was that it was fairly loud. Um, you know, if you may... Uh, think about it. if you, if you go here in the United States, generally, uh, if you have an announcer in a movie or something, you know, say, uh, you know, at the Ford Pavilion, you'd have Walt Disney, Henry Ford, they would be, uh, you know, the dinosaurs, uh, you know, the age of the, it was every, every, you know, calm presented sort of thing. If you go to Japan, my recollection of it was, there's dinosaurs, there's everything, you gotta go see it. It was loud. It was, it was a lot of, uh, you know, uh, at, animation and the voice and everything. So, as I walked through the aisleways, uh, like I said, there were people, buy my stuff, no my stuff. And I guess that's what they're saying. I don't know because it was Japanese, but there was a lot of noise. I don't remember background music going through the, the fair so much. Uh, I do remember announcements being made at particular times. Uh, you know, and again, I, I asked my interpreter one or two times, and she said, oh, that's about a, a something that's being held at Expo Theater or Expo Hall or something, or uh, one time was a lost kid. But I don't remember a lot about background music, but there was a lot of music in all these uh, th these shows, all the the uh, uh, the, the um, movies. As a matter of fact, I thought at one point I was buying a CD. Uh, I have it somewhere around here, and I thought I was buying a music of uh, CDs, uh, a CD of music from the fair. And it turned out it's a CD with Expo '85 printed on it, and absolutely nothing on the disc whatsoever. So that was a little. Maybe that was their ambient music. Maybe there was none. Somebody asked a question about the 3D exhibits. Do they require eyeglasses? Yeah, they had every type of, uh, no quick shutter eye ones, but they had uh, polarized ones, color uh, ones, and uh, again, that you would uh, put on, uh, give back, and, and, you know, walk out. You know, I was thinking earlier when I was reminding myself of stuff today, you know, think about whistles. You know, you're taking a whistle and you had to give the whistle back. You wonder how they sterilize them or clean them. Of course, now with COVID, you wouldn't even want to touch a whistle, let alone share a whistle. But yeah, uh, everybody had 3D glasses. You would uh, go and, uh, uh, you know, just like at the, the Disney parks, throw them in a big bin, uh, you know, as you came off the ride. But 
Uh, I don't remember any quick shutter ones uh, because I think the logistics of that would be a little too much. Most of them, if I remember, were polarized, but a lot of 3D movies. Uh, the Kuramakin uh, ride system looks like an Omni mover. Yeah, like I said, you'd feel like you'd seen a, a few uh, a number of these things before. Uh, solar powered boat outside Panasonic could be. 3D TV systems, yes, there were, uh, right, everything. Uh, how many hours do I spend at the fair? I went a couple times. Uh, basically, I was supposed to go down to Australia, New Zealand on a Saturday. I said, no, I can go on a Sunday. So uh, I can go out here and go after night. And uh, gee, I can end up work early on Friday. If we, if we work really, really hard, I can get done. Who'd like to go to the World's Fair with me? So um, a, a couple of the staff people said, you know, we, we could actually work on the bus on the way out there and then work on the bus on the way home. And we could work when we were standing on line. So, okay, we'll declare Friday a work day as we go to the fair. So that, that kind of worked out well, because it was actually interesting. It's like people that lived in New York that never go to the Statue of Liberty. These people were right there, the World's Fair was there. They never got around to going. But when me, the dumb Gaijin said, I want to go out to the World's Fair, okay. So we'd be standing on line and uh, uh, talking about something, and, you know, how we were going to do, do this new computer system or whatever. And we go something else, come out, where were we, we'd, we'd pick it up again. So we were able to write off our day at the fair as a, uh, as a business expense. Worked out well. Uh, yeah, Midori looked like golf balls. You know, again, a lot of inflated, or not inflated, but, you know, uh, buildings with a uh, big empty space inside for all the theaters and domes and that. And Joey had his hand up. Uh, so, Joey, what, what can we answer for you? Oh, uh, hi, Bill. Um, someone had asked me, first of all, if I was related to uh, Joey Vento of uh, Philly, uh, the cheesesteak king. And no, I'm not. And reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. So uh, that's for Scott. The other thing I wanted to ask, Bill, um, were there any Japanese film companies there, like Toho? I know they're very big in Japan. Um, no. Did they sponsor anything or film anything? Did you see film crews? I didn't see any film crews. When I was out there, I was getting near the end of Expo. Uh, again, I had just not planned my particular trip at any particular time. But uh, right. there was, uh, I don't recall anything from the, the <laughs> film industry being out there, people taking uh, pictures of it. Um, and I don't recall any exhibits, uh, you know, just like, you know, here in the United States, I don't remember Warner Brothers uh, Pavilion or anything. It was, uh, it was pretty much an industrial sort of fair. And like I said, an awful lot of, uh, uh, you know, things for the Panasonics, uh, you know, uh, the Toshibas, the Fujitsus, that sort of thing. Right, right. Right. Okay. Uh, not a lot of Japanese car companies, too. I mean, if you notice, there was no uh, Toyota Pavilion, no, no Datsun Pavilion, you know, no Honda Pavilion. Uh, again, this was structured towards things that you might find in your home. The, the one, the Kuramakin one, they did have a whole thing of uh, concept cars, but uh, I don't remember anything as far as, you know, Honda motorcycles or anything else like that. Right. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Sure. Any other thoughts or comments? Yes, Randy. Uh, yeah, my experience going to uh, Asian World's Fairs was similar to yours as far as standing out as a Westerner. Uh, when I went to Expo 70, there were a lot of people from very rural areas of Japan, and they actually would ask for your autograph, and they would ask to take a picture with you. Yes. And the same thing. I'd be trying to get into line like the Mitsubishi Pavilion, which was a very long line, yeah, I couldn't get into the line because people were stopping me constantly, you know, asking for autographs and pictures. Um, and then the same thing about you say you're from Los Angeles. I say Long Beach. Well, they didn't know where that was. I said, well, near Los Angeles. Oh, do you go to Hollywood all the time? Or do you know, you know, an actor or whatever? It's, they have a, a skewed version of, of where we live, which, of course, we do, too, of where they live. So... Yeah, it was interesting. It was another time I was walking down the street in Tokyo and somebody came up to me, uh, again, a Western looking face and came up to me and asked, do you know how to get to the so-and-such restaurant? And I said, well, I actually do, but what made you think I speak English? And they said, well, you're American, aren't you? And I said, yeah, but I could have been, you know, Irish. I could have been German. I, you know, I mean, it was it's just, it struck me as the ugly American syndrome that they just assumed because they spoke English 
everybody else that was non-Japanese would speak English. But yeah, it was, it was really interesting at all the different times uh, over there. Uh, you know, like I said, people would come up and sometimes they'd be talking to you. And yeah. If I was just walking down the street and I didn't have an interpreter, I'd have no idea what they were trying to ask me or tell me or something. And uh, yeah, it, 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 it was kind of a unique experience. And the very first time I went over, was uh, you know, a real eye opener. I was scared to death I wasn't gonna be able to find my way around and the Japanese subway system, every other sign was English. It was, it was able to actually get by uh, quite easily. So for the most part, I had the interpreter with me you know, during the day because I'd be in meetings and I'd need it. And then at night I was on my own. Do you guys remember the Doonesbury comic strip you know, uh, where Duke goes to uh, China and he's giving a speech? I, I had a thing where I was giving a talk and I had 200 people in a theater and we were trying to talk about how we we're going to revolutionize the Japanese film industry with new computers and that. And all these people are staring at me and, um, you know, I'd say something, interpreter would say it, I'd say something back and forth. And at one point I told a joke and uh, everybody in the, she interpreted and everybody laughed. And as they were doing it, all I could think was a, a Doonesbury comic strip where Duke the ambassador tells a joke and, uh, uh, the interpreter says, American tell joke, everybody laugh. And everybody laugh in, in his mind. He goes, man, I'm slaying it. And I'm like, I got myself so lost as soon as I said the joke. And they all started laughing. All of a sudden, I, all I could think was Doonesbury. And I had to stop thinking, oh, where was I in my presentation? I really threw myself off. But uh, yeah, I was, I, I, I was lucky. I had a, a, a small staff in Japan. So I went over there a couple of times. One time, I actually went to Japan twice in one week. I had uh, flown over there. They had given us an incredible uh, mandate to open a home video business in 90 days from uh, you know, from the time they said go to finding an office, building an office, staffing the office, hiring uh, the computers, programming, you know, everything. And I flew over there, I was there for a week, uh, went through everything with everybody, what they're gonna do, uh, everybody understand, right? Flew back to the United States, got, got home, had to go to New York for a meeting th the next week. I get a call. Uh, they're not doing anything you told them to do in Japan. They don't want to do it your way. They want to do it the Japanese way. And uh, the Japanese way was that they wanted to do, uh, I had, again, three months to get this done. Uh, so they wanted to go off and uh, do a, a project that was going to take about three years and do it in three months. And their whole idea was to uh, hire a massive army of people to do it. So I flew into New York, uh, to, back to Tokyo on a Sunday. And Monday was a holiday called Golden Day. And I called him all into the office and said, do you really think you can hire so many people and get this all done at the same time? They all said, yes. I said, that's like trying to get nine women pregnant at once to have a baby in a month. It doesn't work. We're going to do it my way. And anybody right. that doesn't want to do it my way can leave. So you have a choice. Right. Get a box and put your stuff in it. We're going to lunch. Right. Who's going to lunch? Well, we, they went to lunch and we got it open. But I flew back. To, I was in Japan about 22 hours. I flew back that, that night. So we got it done, but yeah, it was a, it was a unique country to work in. Um, and I imagine a number of uh, other Disney folks here have uh, enjoyed some of the th fact that we'll say yes to you on everything, meaning, yes, I hear you. And it doesn't mean, yes, I'm going to do it. You had that experience, Rich? Yeah, I was traveling. Take your shoes off to go inside the shrine. And uh, when I came back out, the kids were on, uh, we're taking pictures of my shoes because they're size 12 shoes and they were the biggest <laughs> shoes they'd seen. Yeah, it was, it was funny. The very first thing is you remember that my first night I got there, I was jet lagged as could be. I, I, I was tired and everything and I had to go out to a, a business dinner and we went to the restaurant and they uh, took away your shoes when you walked in and gave you these little uh, sandals to wa uh, want, walk around the restaurant on. So I went back to the table, ah, oh, got to sit on the floor. Uh, you know, there, there's no, uh, no seats or anything. And I finally went up to use the uh, men's room and I had to put my little sandals on. And I, I was halfway across the restaurant and one of the sandals just came off and it was like skipping a stone across a, a peb, uh, you know, pebble across a pond. It just went shooting across the restaurant. So now I have to walk, you know, with one sh on and get it. And I'm just watching all these Japanese people sitting there just trying very politely not to laugh their ass off at me. But I, I was... I was mortified. Well, luckily, I only wear uh, size eight shoes. Nobody took pictures of mine. Hey, Bill, Glenn, it seems like um, uh, this fair was more reminiscent of the 60s and 50s fairs. It seemed more progress and technology based than a lot of the ones that came in the 70s and the 
early 80s. Is that an, an accurate view of it or uh, not so cultural and environmental? Well, it's a lot, lot of technology, which again is a technology city. There was one of the uh, pavilions, I forget which one it was offhand, which was kind of interesting that they tried to blend technology in with uh, history and their prediction uh, was that video phones were going to take over the world, uh, just like the Bell system. Everybody's going to have a video phone. And they went back to show how life would have been at the turn of the century if you had a video phone. So you would, uh, you know, talk in the video phone to the corner grocer who, you know, do things. Then you would talk to the blacksmith guy about, is my horse ready yet? And all on video phones. It was kind of a really weird you know, combination of things. By the way, speaking of horses, I don't remember which pavilion it was, but there was one pavilion that had two horses at the end of it. We came through the show and they had two live horses and they made a big thing about these were the only live animals at the Expo 67 or Expo 85. Uh, you had all these robotic birds. So you had robotic, uh, you know, dinosaurs, your robotic stuff, but they had two live horses and it was a real, real big, you know, that was their, their big calling thing. But no, it was, it was, it was, like I said, uh, technology, uh, lots of robots. Uh, everywhere you went, there was a robot. There were, like I said, robot sketch artists, robot ice painter, uh, sculptors, was robot painters, robot musicians. So the whole big thing uh, that I took out of it was that uh, we were going to have robots doing all the work, you know, that everybody does today. And, uh, you know, it was going to be a utopia in that sort of way. So uh, I do remember a lot about music, music synthesizers, uh, you know, again, different pavilions. Um, so it, it, was, it was an interesting experience, again, particularly because I had no idea, you know, that I was going over there. I didn't have any study or history or anything. It was just like, oh, you, you want to go to the World's Fair? You know, wow, yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, put, sign me up for that one. So it was a, it was, it was a fun, fun experience uh, to just stumble across. Glenn, did you work uh, in Japan at all? Uh, yes, I made a number of trips over there to, um, you know, the first gate. Right, and I thought you had. I was working on uh, several attraction upgrades, you know, converting the sound systems to the newer technologies. And then I had, they had me doing the show quality uh, work where I would go through all the attractions with a group of maintenance people and we would make notes on what's wrong and fix things and it's just part of our QC ongoing QC thing and it was interesting that we would walk around we always wore suit and tie and I had a big trench coat because it was really cold and you'd walk with this group of people and I'd stop and I'd love to stop and just turn around quickly and see all these girls looking and pointing and giggling and you know it was like who are these guys yeah, it took a lot getting used to. It was, uh, you know, yeah. kind, kind Another of a different thing. Fun thing. I'm sure you've been to Maui on the sugarcane train since you're a big train fan. Been to Maui, but not on the train. Well, there's a little sugarcane train, and my wife and I were over there, and we were sitting waiting for it to go, and I got up to take pictures of the cab, and I come back, and there was a group of Japanese tourists, men, all taking turns having their picture taken with my wife sitting on the little so yeah they love they love uh they love us i guess and they were great people great fun to work with well i, I enjoyed yeah. all my trip. the only thing i didn't like is we'd go into a conference room and everybody would be sitting there and it was just like the old west with their gun on the table they all had their cigarettes on the table oh yeah and i hope they've changed that i haven't been over there since late 90s but uh that was the only thing that was pretty hard to take was all the smoking. Yeah, the smoking was horrible in our office. Uh, it was really interesting. Uh, we had, uh, for whatever reason, I, somebody's computer broke and I, I took it apart to look at it and it was, it was disgusting. I mean, the amount of, and I said, how long you had this computer? Oh, a year. I mean, it was absolutely fouled up inside with tobacco stains and just, uh, like I said, everybody smoked. I remember we went one night to a, uh, of all things, a German beer hall uh, that somebody wanted to go to. And uh, the smoke in there was unbelievable. I finally had to leave. It was, it was, it was just, I, I've never been any place that anybody smoked as much. And by that point in time in the United States, they outlawed all the cigarette vending machines that we used to see all over the place. And in Tokyo, they were everywhere. Just, you know, cigarette vending machines and uh, uh, everybody smoked like crazy. I, it drove me, I hated it. Well, speaking of the beer hall, 
it was probably like that for you, but their culture is you never pour your own beer. They always pour into your glass. So your glass is never empty and you can't possibly leave with an empty glass. So that was their way of, I think, getting everybody really toasted. <laughs> you know, I was, I was lucky. As I mentioned, my dad worked for a Japanese company. And he did, gave me an awful lot of pointers as far as how to uh, operate at Japanese meetings. And he said, one of the rudest things you could do is take somebody's business card and just put it in your pocket. You know, right, right. you would go to a meeting and you would hand it and you, right. you know, hand it with two hands, then take theirs and all. And I had my business cards printed with, uh, um, you know, my name and title on one side and the Japanese translation on the other side. And they were so honored that I made it easy for them to remember Kata-san's name, you know, by doing it. But I remember it was very helpful for me because I'm horrible in names. I can forget somebody's name as I'm shaking their hands. But now I would sit in a meeting. I would lay all the cards out on the table in roughly the order of where they were sitting at the room. So when somebody would say something, I could look down and say, oh, yes, uh, Barker-san, you know, and, <laughs> you know, remember who is who. So the, the, the business cards were a huge help to me. Well, they would call me Glenson. And I said, why don't you call me Barker-san? And they said, well, laughingly, the Baka in Japanese means idiot. So it's like saying Mr. <laughs> idiot. Ah, uh, that explains why they well, called me Barker-san the whole time. Damn, now <laughs> I know. <laughs> but a lot of us were on first names, you know, Johnson and Kurtzson and people like that. Yeah, uh, our, my office was more formal as everybody went by by last name. So it was, but it was, a, yeah, it was an interesting experience. I, um, I, like I said, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And you know, Warner Brothers was great because we stayed at all five-star hotels and, you know, we just had a, a heck of a good time. So, uh, you know, I, I've tried to interest my family going back to Japan. And now when I look up the prices of it, I go, ah, God, it's yeah. <laughs> scary now. Yeah, those days are over. Yeah, Randy. Yeah, a couple of questions. One is one expo related, one not, <clears throat> or wants a comment. You were talking about the, um, taking that computer apart and uh, finding it all gunked up with nicotine or whatever. Um, I worked for Western Airlines as a flight attendant from 1977 to 87 and Delta bought Western. But I can remember uh, we were still flying 707s and 720Bs when I started. At that time, they were about 17 to 20 years old. And we'd write up a pressure leak at a door, let's say the one right door. Mechanic would come on. And uh, he'd open the door and he'd say, your leak's right here. And what he was tracing was the trail of tobacco stains and nicotine and gunk that was being sucked out through that pressure leak. So he was able to find that, just <laughs> open the door looking for brown tar, basically. And the other thing was, uh, your pictures, uh, the crowds at Expo look pretty formidable. I, I don't know anything about it. I didn't know anything about Expo 85. So last night I <clears throat> went on the BIE website. And I guess the attendance was about 20 million, mm -hmm. which is pretty substantial for a fair of that size. So I would assume that it was crowded pretty much day and night. Yeah, it, it was. And I, I made a mistake earlier. I said the, the 2 million it was the 20th million visitor that was out there. Uh, it was crowded, but it, I, I was very impressed by how fast everything moved. Um, there, um, they did a really good job with a lot of pre-shows. I don't remember anything that I stood in line for maybe more than 40 minutes, 45 minutes, something like that. There was no two, two and a half hour waits or anything that I remember. Um, and like I said, it, uh, it, it moved very quickly. They had uh, uh, people got in, they stood in line, they behaved themselves. Uh, thing I w was impressed by was the very large plazas, the open walkways that uh, I don't have any recollections of feeling uh, claustrophobic or pushing through crowds or anything like that, that it was, uh, uh, it was, it was pretty busy out there. I, I do remember again, uh, the tour guide, when I said I wanted to eat at McDonald's the one night, she was sort of horrified because the, the one thing I do remember was a, a sort of formidable wait for uh, food, um, you know, that there were an, not a plethora of uh, food rest uh, restaurants or <clears throat> whatever. I mean, there were a lot of things. That I don't know what they were serving. There was, you know, little hole in the wall window type things. But for real restaurant sort of stuff, there wasn't much of it. So uh, she wanted to go to some nicer thing. I think again because we were on an expense account. I said I I'm on a time account. Let's just go here. We'll I'll, we'll go to a nice restaurant in Tokyo tomorrow. But um, 
uh, I, the only thing I do remember uh, having a congestion was, uh, you know, trying to get some food. But the, the, the rides itself or the shows themselves, because they were movies, they moved people in really quickly. You know, they, they had pretty good seating capacity. Uh, you know, they'd show the 10, 12 minute movie and throw the entire crowd back out again. So it, it went pretty quickly. Yeah, the Japanese, I think, have crowd control pretty, you know, uh, they do it well. I can remember first time I went to uh, mainland China, uh, took JAL to Narita and then transferred and uh, flew to Hong Kong. And in Narita, it was a seven, both like 747, but it was like 20 minutes to departure time. And I'm telling my partner, it's like, they're never going to get this thing out on time. So they started boarding. It was packed full and closed the door right on time. They had turnstiles. And you went through a turnstile. There was no agent there. There was an agent standing off to the side. And if there was an issue with your ticket, the turnstile would lock. The agent would come over and deal with it. But people just went through like they were going on the subway or something. There was no scanning of tickets other than, you know, you placing your ticket on the, the reader not an agent taking it from you and scanning it. So it was, it was I was amazed. There are probably like 400 and some odd people onto a 747 in 20 minutes. Wow, uh, that is Never impressive. Never do that here. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, Kathy asks, have I ever done a presentation in Tokyo Disneyland? No, I, I can look at that. And I might be asking some of my Disney fans, uh, friends here for some help. Uh, I do, I did go I think about a half a dozen times, but I did never. I never made it to Tokyo Sea. That was done uh, after I had left uh, Warner Brothers, or at least I wasn't going to Japan as much. My, you know, we tended to go to a country, put a computer system in, and then move on. And then I had a staff that would take uh, take care of it. I had uh, 21 different countries uh, I had to deal with for Warner Brothers, so it was uh, it, it kept me busy. Uh, I, I did my. I think about two and a half million miles in American right now and a million on United, something like that. So, yeah, it, it, it got to the point where, you know, particularly England, I went to England about every six weeks for 12 years. And, uh, you know, it got to the point, I, I remember getting on the plane one time and the flight attendant, you know, I, I knew right what seat I wanted on the upper deck of the 747. I was, was right there, easy shot down the stairs, out to the door when we landed. And uh, I came on on the plane, and the, the flight attendant was like, "Oh, hi, Mr. Cotter. It's nice to see you again." I said, "Oh, hi, hi, Susan. Good to see you." And uh, I said, "Is uh, George up front today?" "No, he's got the week off, but he said to say hi." Uh, Harry's up uh, flying uh, left seat. I said, "Oh, okay." And the guy next to me said, "Oh, how long have you worked for the airline?" I said, "Oh, I don't, I don't work for the airline." <laughs> he goes, "Well, they all know you." And I said, "Oh, I see him every month, you know." So, uh, but it was, it was a great job until the kids started growing up and then, uh, you know, you start missing school plays and that, that sort of thing. But Carol, it was nice because I could go to England and uh, downgrade my ticket because I was entitled to go first or business, downgraded the coach, the two of us could go over, uh, I'd work for a week, she'd go off sightseeing and then we could take another week and go drive through the countryside and come home and my net cost of the vacation was near zero. So worked worked great. Say, Bill, I noticed in all the photos you were showing at this uh, expo how temporary and flimsy the buildings look. Compared to, say, New York City, what impressed me in New York was how massive and permanent they look. They look like they were built to last forever, which was a false impression. But in Tokyo, it looks like they could have torn that thing down on a weekend. Just look like uh, canvas walls on a, a thin metal frame, the way you put up awnings. Yeah, and they were smart that way. They really were. I mean, that was, I, again, I love the 64 World's Fair, but that was my, uh, the big ass mistake that Robert Moses made was about, you know, char trying to charge the international countries for uh, participating, which was a, a strict no no. Uh, if you look at other fairs, like Expo 86 did the exact same thing that Expo 85 did put up real temporary structures. Everybody gets the same building and you get a bucket of paint and you make it your own. And that's what was the big thing they had done with this is that they built these structures. Um, you know, they were not intended to last forever. I mean, if you look at some of them, you know, they, they were pretty impressive buildings. But for the most part, build it. It's a six month uh, window and, you know, get in, get out and, and get it done. So uh, you didn't have anything like the General Motors Pavilion. Uh, you didn't have massive pavilions like the Ford Pavilion and that which is why you didn't have a lot of ride systems and why you had a lot of movies. Uh, you know, ride systems require a much bigger building, infrastructure, expense, and that sort of thing. Uh, movies you can do real cheap, uh, real fast, throw a screen up, project it, and go. So 
uh, they were pretty smart in what they had done. They had never intended to uh, make any of this stuff permanent. I don't think any of it was left. You can still, there's a, a train now that goes out there and they still have the, uh, the major center, uh, you know, the, uh, the ones I showed at, at near the end. And they have a, a pretty nice planetarium out there and some other stuff. But, uh, you know, the, the fair itself is, you know, no sign of it. If you go on, I went on about a year ago, I went on a, you know, satellite view trying to, you know, pick my own way around. And, you know, there's just, oh, yeah, okay, I guess that's where that was. So, yeah, it was there. It was built. It was gone exactly as intended. But it was, they did do it right. They did have a tremendous, uh, uh, you know, uh, international participation. Like I remember there was a Bulgarian pavilion and I don't think anybody from America had ever gone to Bulgaria that I ever knew of, but you could walk in and see, you know, the B Bulgarian pavilion. Uh, I don't know if they've ever been at another world's fair or not, but that, that's, they were really smart with that, what they did with uh, XO85. Like I said, you know, it's actually interesting other than, you know, the U S pavilion. I'm, I hope nothing I said uh, about not liking it was anything that Steve had worked on. I was, the pavilion was nice. It was nice to see some other Americans and talk to them, and they were glad to see me and ask, hey, how's the news back home? Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I was disappointed in, like I said, there was no big, you know, uh, like circle of vision, th you know, 360 of America the Beautiful sort of thing. But it was really neat uh, just walking to different pavilions. Like there was one I walked into, and uh, they had a... Um, the concept was you would look at a computer screen, uh, see a newspaper article that you liked, push a button and it would print you that edition of the newspaper at your house, but it only print the articles that you wanted to see. Uh, and the issue was at that time, the computer screens were not uh, high definition enough that you could actually read or do a lot of this on it. But the uh, idea was that you could, and then you would also pay for it by the article you printed. But that was the sort of thing they were promoting at the time that, you know, uh, personalized newspapers that, you know, I'm not a big sports fan, so my newspaper wouldn't have a sports section. Why should I pay for a sports section I'm not going to read? And I, I just remember, you know, predictions like that were cool. Um, you know, I was, uh, it, it was a real whirlwind run from pavilion to pavilion to pavilion, but it was, uh, I was so lucky. I, I mean, if I'd gone a month later, I would have, people would have said, oh, it's too bad you missed the World's Fair. I would have been real upset, so. Uh, let's see, have to run like the second, okay, Tokyo Disneyland, okay. Um, uh, we will have to see about Tokyo Disneyland and uh, maybe we'll reach out to uh, Glenn and others as far as that. Uh, for next week, I was thinking of, uh, 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 Don, I've got to get back to you on uh, your uh, Route 66. You did send that to me and it is on my list of things to look at. So maybe we'll look at, would Route 66 work for you in two weeks? You're muted, Don. He's not saying no. Oh, he... <laughs> there we go. I'm an admin. I can't unmute myself. Okay. Uh, yeah, that'd be fine. If, if you think folks would be interested, I'd be happy to do it. Oh, I love great. Yeah. I, we took a drive on Route 66, go see the jackalopes and all the rest of it. So yeah, mm -hmm. I'd love to do it. Next week, I thought what I would do is uh, do Disneyland as seen through uh, vintage souvenir slides. When I did it the last uh, two times for Disneyland, That'd I did cool. uh, you know, pictures that I took. But I thought people might like to see how the Disneyland uh, sold uh, it to uh, people on the Panaview slides and the Technicolor slides and every other thing. So, uh, um, so uh, I may change my mind. We'll see how the week goes. But uh, yeah, now that I got that book done, it's it's great. I got to go and uh, you know figure out. Yeah, somebody was saying road trip. Yeah. Uh, again, you know, I've mentioned this before. Uh, if if there's something in your own town, your own area, you know, if uh, you know, there's something that you think people would like to get a kick out of seeing or whatever, um, you know, like if you're in New York and you'd like to show us the wonders of Letchworth State Park, you know, the Grand Canyon of the East, uh, you know, I, we, could, we can do a potpourri. There was a, a woman that I, I helped uh, write a book on the 39 World's Fair uh, that just did an author's thing this past week that was kind of fun to listen to. And I, I've helped a couple people with 39 books, and I think I'm going to try to reach, reach out to them and ask if they would like to do a you know, round robin about their books about uh, about the fair and stuff. So uh, again, my email's on the site or most people have it, just send me uh, suggestions and be, uh, be glad to do it. So uh, appreciate folks joining today and uh, hope everybody's weather cooperates wherever they are. As you know, out here we said, we're gonna melt this week one more time. And 
it's been so frustrating. It's been really hot, but we can't even go and use the swimming pool because the air is unhealthy. And they tell you don't go in, you know, don't go outdoors at all, and th certainly don't exercise. So it's uh, all of a sudden it's going to be really, really hot and cold, and I'm going to be, you know, looking at the pool and saying can't use it now. So again, appreciate everybody joining. Hope everybody has a, a great week. And uh, uh, I will send out, again, if you're not on the email uh, uh, list that I send out, uh, I will post the, uh, the, the, the link on the site the day before. If you do want to be on the email list, just send me an uh, email and I'll put you on it. So thanks, everybody, and have a great day. Thanks, Bill. Bye -bye, Bill. Take Thank care. You. Thanks. See you all later.